Luke 2, and it um, verse, starts in verse 8. It says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Sorry. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angels, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, heaven on earth, and peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. I don't know about you all. I don't know what happened to those sheep. They just left. I mean, as far as I, I mean, as far as we can see, they just left. Well, let's imagine that there were 99 sheep. They left all 99. It doesn't say if they told their kids to keep the sheep. It doesn't say if they went to their neighbors and said, um, bro, will you take an eye, keep an eye out on my sheep? They just left. Well, doesn't the Lord leave the 99 and, leave, and come after us when we need him? It just makes me wonder how often the Lord is asking us to leave the 99 things that we have to do every day, every minute of every day, and go after the one true lamb, the spotless lamb that came for me, and he came for you, and he did whatever it took. He gave his all for all of us. It makes me wonder how many times he beckons me and I don't leave the 99 text messages that I get every few minutes or DMs or phone calls or the 99 people that are asking for my attention or the 99 times my grandchildren say, can I come over? Whatever it is, they left their sheep and they went looking for the lamb. He leaves the 99 and he will go after one of us. And he's, I mean, he's going to do whatever it takes to keep us too. That's a challenge to me. Lord, help us to leave the 99 things that we have on our plate every minute of every day to go after him. And I just thought that would bless y'all. And y'all keep praying for Kenny. The Lord's blessed. The Lord has certainly done a miracle. But we still need your prayer. Praise God. I just uh, <clears throat> want to just give God the glory for his presence here this morning. He's here in a special way today. The peace of God is in this place. It's not about this building, but it's because he resides in us. And I don't care what you're going through today. Jesus has come to save us from our sins. And I'll tell you what, he is more than capable to do that. He is doing that. He's delivering us each and every day. Behold God is our salvation. I will trust. I will not be afraid when I look in the mirror and I think things aren't happening. Behold God is my salvation this morning. I will trust his word because he exalts his word above everything, even above his name, which they said, here's the son. You're going to call him Jesus because he will save his people. That is a done deal. He is going to save his people from their sins, and he is doing that. I appreciate the Lord this morning. I just appreciate whatever is going on in our lives. I appreciate just, I don't know, man, there was just a stillness here this morning for me just to focus on who God is, who his son is, what he's able to do for us, what he is doing for us. I don't care what problem you have this morning. God is bigger than it, and he can deliver you. He can deliver me. And I believe he is, but he wants us to come to him this morning. He's drawing us. He wants us to start this new year coming up, walking with him in a way we never have before. Just seeking his face, getting alone with him, getting in his word. Not because he it's a duty, but because we love him. Because I need help, folks. I don't know about you. I need his word to, lie, to lead me and guide me every single moment, every day. And it's available. 
Lord, give us the strength, give us the courage, give us the battle plan that we need this year going in, that we can walk with him and talk with him and be his people that he's called us to be. And I'm not talking about y'all, I'm talking about myself. <laughs> I need him every day, but uh, we do. You know, we, we want to, as uh, Kathy said there, we want to reach out to that one. You know, we we'll go to the Lord, but he wants to use us in a special way too. I believe he is, but I believe he's doing a work in our hearts. But let's just go to him this morning, man, and just, just give him everything. I don't know what's going in your heart and your mind this morning, but he is able to touch. He's able to bring life where there is death. He can do that. He has done that. He is doing that for each one of us. Praise God. Praise God. Like JP, um, I just appreciate the Lord's presence here this morning. I tell you, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, there's strength. There were so many of the songs this morning, even through the, throughout the worship service and also when the choir was up here, that really pointed to our situation, but not only that, who God is. Um, the, uh, Behold God. On days that I'm weak, it's hard to believe. Still, I know he'll see me through. He'll give me the power to conquer the hour and everything I do. And that, I mean, we all, when it comes right down to it, are weak. We need him. We need this Christ, the one that came a little baby. I mean, that's why there was so much rejoicing the angel was singing. He, he was getting ready to come here. He was born as a baby, but it was what he was to accomplish that would affect us in our everyday life, and that is today. Today. And... Um, Another one of the songs, so many of the songs, there's so much in it. I can't remember all that was sung, but just as I am. Uh, without one plea, but that your blood was shed for me, and that you bid me come to thee. It's not that just he died for us and he did all that he did. He asked us to come. Yeah. And that's what JP was just saying there. And Kathy, he wants to seek after him because of who he is. He did all he did for us, us. It's hard to believe sometimes at the historical Jesus you see, you see paintings of, that it was a very practical thing that happened when he came here. He became a savior. He became a rescuer. And all of that, after he died and ascended, he was made great high priest. Not just high priest. He wasn't even from the tribe of Levi. From the tribe of Judah came a great high priest. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of times I think on our journey where the gospel means the most to us is where it meets us in our hour of need. Because it's going to meet us in our hour of need. We're going to have needs. And the thing of it is the Lord, just like... Was so, it was so wonderful in those songs. He doesn't say, well, you've got a need. What's wrong with you? Why haven't you read your Bible more? He just says, come to me. Come to me and get what you need because I am what you need and I have what you need. And um, like I was saying where the gospel meets us, I, I went out this morning to pray and I was thinking, uh, like I'm sure everybody here, you're aware of your own weaknesses and your own faults and your whatever else you got. But, you know, I thought about that throne of grace. What does it say for us to do? And why do we go there? I mean, we have deficits in our character, our issues, but there's a place that we go to to get something we can't get in ourselves from someone who reigns. He is, a high, he is the great high priest. And I, and I, and I thought about, I'm just going to read this briefly, but Hebrews 4, uh, the, the end of it, which we're so familiar with, but it wasn't just who we go to, it's where he's at. It's, okay, I'm going to go down to, to verse 14. Because Jesus, because he took on him flesh and he suffered, he's able to help us as we suffer and as we have to face the things we face. And that's what makes him this great high priest and intercessor that he is. He's able to give us exactly what we need. Every person here may have something completely different going on, and he's able to meet every person's need. Because... He said he, he suffered when he was tempted. He's able to help us when we're being tempted. He helps us in our sorrows. He helps us with everything. There's nobody like Jesus. There's nobody like Jesus. So then, 
since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. Aren't you glad? He understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same testing we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly. It does not say that, and because and, uh, I'm like this a lot of times. It's like I'm hesitant. It's almost like we're Isaiah when he went to the throne room in Isaiah 6. And he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And he said, woe is me, I am undone. I mean, he, he was literally in a state of shock and awe. And he said, he said I'm done. But he said an angel flew to, flew to him with the coal he had taken from the, with the tongs from the altar and put it on his lips. He said, you're clean. When we go straight into God's presence, there's a cleansing that takes place. That he invites us to partake of because he knows our condition. If he didn't know our condition, what condition would we be in? We're talking a holy Christ who welcomes us into the throne room of God. Do you know he sees us without spot? That's hard to believe because we see the spots. I'll tell you what, he sees us as glorified in him through what he's done. When he cried out on that cross, it is finished. There was a work that was done and accomplished that he knew had happened right then that would come to fruition, and it was done. But it worked itself out real time in our situations in our life as we walk on this Christian journey. We don't see it all come to fruition at one time. It sometimes, does it ever seem slow to you? Yeah, slow. Like, you're talking line upon line and precept. I'm talking about microscopic precept upon precept. It seems that it's slow-mo. I mean, I'm talking super slow motion. But you know what? When God says something, it's going to come to pass. Just as it was proclaimed that he would show up one day as that little baby, guess what? He came. It said he would die. He told the disciples, I'm going to die for you, but I'm going to be raised from the dead. That happened too. And what it all culminated into is this great high priest. This, it says that, you know, it says he still ministers. High priests were called to minister. And I think it's when I read this, let me finish reading. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, our gracious God. Thank God he's a gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. He invites us to come to him despite everything that's going on to get exactly what we need when we need it most. And that's the, one of the secrets of the gospel. It was so wonderful. And while the angels sang when he was born, in some measure, heaven knew what was going on. A lot of times the disciples and even the prophets that prophesied of old didn't know. But they knew the Savior had come. He had come, but he didn't just come. He died, and he was raised in the power of God. And where he stands now and meets us, is where, in, where we are invited to, um, you know, the temple. When the temple was constructed, there was, it was the holy place and there was the most holy place. You didn't even go in there unless you were a priest. And you didn't dare go in the most holy place unless you, you were the priest, the high, the high priest. It went only one time a year. And if you went in there and you didn't do everything just right, pop, you were gone. You were dead. But in that temple... When Jesus died and cried out, it is finished, that curtain ripped from top to bottom. And that's, that's where we're invited to go. The throne room of God. The most holy place. I mean, can you believe it? I believe it. I say, Lord, help my unbelief sometimes. Because it's so tremendous and so awesome and so pure. And yet he invites us, come. Come to me. Come just like you are. Don't try to fix yourself. You can't fix yourself. You can't fix anything. I've done the fixing. But the thing of it is he present tense now fixes it. He gives and ministers grace because he's ministering in that temple. Let me go to uh, just, just break one verse in, in uh, Hebrews 8. Uh, I, read, I read this this morning and it blessed me. You can read all of Hebrews. It's a pretty good sized book. But it's so much about Jesus and who he is. I'll tell you what, we have everything that we need in Jesus Christ. Verse 1 of Hebrews 8, here is the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of the 
majestic God in heaven. There he ministers in the heavenly tabernacle, the true place of worship, which was built by the Lord and not by human hands. Can you imagine that's the place we're going? <laughs> that's the place we're invited to go. Boldly go there because he is willing to give us what we need. And he loves us. He loves us and he died for us so that he could actually do, be this high priest and minister to us from that place now. I mean, I think it's tremendous. I praise him for it. I praise him for the fact that he was put where he's at and he's ministering there today for me and for you. And, and it's not until we get good enough. We'll never be good enough. Truth of the matter is we are good enough because it was, there was a song we sang right when we stood up. It was, uh, I'm getting ready for the marriage feast. Yes, I am. Can you? And uh, you know why? He, we have been given robes of righteousness. Without those robes of righteousness, we will go to no marriage party when it comes to Jesus. But because he provided a robe of righteousness for us, praise God. He sees us. He literally sees us without spot. And, and he, has pur I mean, he has purified us. Uh, Hebrews 9. I don't want to read all this because maybe I'm not qualified to do that. But I'll, I'll just go down to 11. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all and secured our redemption forever. That sounds pretty sure. One time forever. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you for what you did for us. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For the power of the eternal uh, spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. That is why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people. So that we can all who are called can receive the internal inheritance God has promised them. There was no priest that died for the people until Jesus came. Not only did he offer blood he offered his own blood and then he stood in the place to give us what we need because of our weaknesses our faults and our need for cleansing and he intercedes now yes. he is ministering it says he ministers so this jesus who forever sat down is still ministering that encourages me it almost makes me get excited that somebody like me can have salvation it does make me excited it makes me excited as i see everyone here that we all are in need of a Savior, and that's who he is. He's a great Christ. He's an interceding great high priest. Okay, let me go on down here. Uh, it talks about the, um, you know, that if, if they, they killed animals. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. But the animal had to die for the blood to be shed. Well, guess what? Jesus had to die for his blood to be shed to pay for our sin. It's that simple. I mean, the foolishness of the God, it talks about the foolishness of preaching. It's so simple, it almost sounds crazy. I mean, but it is real. The simple thing is we're sinners and we desperately need a savior. And he's the only one that, he's the only one that can do it. Um, okay, verse 18. That is why even the first covenant was put into effect with the blood of an animal. For after Moses had read of God's commandment to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats along with water and sprinkled both uh, the, the book of God's law and all the people using hyssop branches and scarlet wool. Then he said, this blood confirms a covenant God has made with you. And in the same way, he sprinkled blood on the tabernacle and on everything used for worship. I mean, they went there and literally put blood on everything. That would be a heck of a service. I mean, can you imagine? It's, but but it, meant, it meant something. We've we got to be purified somehow. We, we have sin. Oh, but thank God for his blood. Thank God for the eternal covenant. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood, for without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. This is, this is what 
I was reminded of this morning. That's, I'm sharing this. That is why the tabernacle and everything in it, which were copies of things in heaven, had to be purified by the blood of animals. But the real things, now he's going to a different place, but the real things in heaven had to be purified with far better sacrifices than the blood of animals. But what in heaven would need to be purified? It said it had to be purified there. One more verse. For Christ did not enter into a holy place and made it with human hands, which is only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. He went in there on our behalf. He went in there, and I'm, I'm going I'm to read one more verse, and I think I'll, I'll close with this, but because it reminded me. This is in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, and just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world, he, he is the spirit at work in the hands of those who refuse to obey God. All of us, all of us, every one of us, used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. But our very, uh, excuse me, but our very nature, by our very nature, we were subject uh, to God's anger, just like everyone else. I mean, we deserve God's wrath on us. Amen. But who experienced the wrath? Jesus Christ. It talks about it. He was crushed for us. Crushed. It took that kind of salvation for us. But this is what I was getting to. But God is so rich in mercy. And he loved us so much. That even though we were dead because of our sin. He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Listen to this verse. For he raised us up from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Seated in heavenly realms. That's where Jesus went. He sees us there. Did he have to purify something? To me, I think the thing he had to purify there was us. He sees us there. That is a sure, eternal, strong salvation. That is a great salvation. The lowliest sinner, like the lady that, uh, remember, poured the almond on his feet. I tell you what, we are all guilty of many things. But Jesus asked, he said, she's so grateful because she had so many sins. But she is forgiven. He told her, your faith has made you whole. You are forgiven. Of course, they always griped about him forgiving somebody. Isn't that amazing? You know what? He said those who are forgiven little maybe love little, but those who are forgiven a lot love a lot. we got a lot of reason to love Jesus. It's not just what he did. It's what it means today. He, yes, somebody said tomorrow. Yes, we'll need him tomorrow. We absolutely will, but guess what? He's ministering in that tabernacle not made with hands. And who is he ministering for? All of us. We all need him equally. But he's got some awesome power. I tell you what, there is nobody like Jesus. There will never be another. We sing that song, Jesus Be the Center. He is the center of all things. He's the center of creation. He's going to be the center of judgment. Every person will stand before him and see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But thank God he's provided a salvation that is real and it's active. And the one who activated is active now interceding for us and everything that we need. i tell you what, he's worthy to be praised. He is worthy. I mean, we are, he is so worthy. We could fall down and worship him for 10 billion years, and it will not be enough. That's why he's given us eternity. <laughs> he's, this is an eternal salvation with an eternal high priest. I just want to say thank you, Lord. I appreciate all that's been shared this morning. I appreciate all the singing. I appreciate everything that pointed to Jesus Christ this morning. 
because he's worthy. He's worthy to be pointed to, gone to, praised, worshipped, and everything else. It's like somebody said again, Kathy and and, uh, uh, J.P. both. The Lord, is it any wonder he says, come to me? He he did what he did so we would come to him. I mean, for someone, there may be somebody here who thinks, I can't. I'm just that bad. No, you're not. Jesus came to save sinners. Sinners. He's such a savior. Such a, he's such a messiah. He's so good. I think I'll, I'll end with that. I'm just so thankful for who he is. Present tense today. Yeah? I appreciate everything this morning. And something I thought about when Kathy and JP spoke was, um, especially Kathy, was that sometimes, well, Jesus always comes after us. He leaves the 99. But sometimes he comes after us to help us reach another one. Like, he speaks, he'll, he'll tell me, Excuse me, he'll bring somebody to mind to pray for. And sometimes I, I'm, I'm going to be honest, sometimes I'm like, Lord, I'm doing something else right this second. It's not really convenient. Um, maybe I'm burning bread in the oven. I don't know. And the smoke alarm's going off, and Jeff is sleeping. And I'm kind of worried about burning the house down. And true stories. Um, but. Sometimes I'm in the middle of washing dishes and he's like, hey, text this person and word of encouragement, whatever. I got soap, I got dishes, I got whatever. And I'm like, okay, let me just finish washing this whatever and then I'll get to it. And honestly, I've done forgot five minutes later because that's just, that's just how my mind is these days. And... Um, I think part of you know what Kathy and JP were saying were stop whatever that is if you can. I mean, don't stop driving down the road or pull off or something if you got a text. But sometimes those are the things that we need to. He's. This is my mind thinking it anyway. He's asking me to go to that person for him. And. I've never really seen it that way before, not specifically the way I'm thinking this morning. I probably understood it before, but not quite the way like Kathy spoke this morning and then JP followed up. And I just appreciate that because imagine, and not to lay a guilt trip on any of us, but imagine the blessings that aren't received when we don't say, okay, I'm going to put this aside for a second. I'm going to stop walking to the kitchen for whatever it is because whatever I'm going to the kitchen for is not as important as praying for whoever or texting whoever. That's not important. The Lord will help me remember why I'm going to the kitchen if he wants me to know. And if he doesn't, then whatever it is doesn't get done. But the more important thing is is reaching out to whoever whatever the situation is. And like the ladies that prayed for Claire at the prayer meeting that day, the Lord moved through them to reach the one. And anybody who's prayed for Kenny, the Lord, you know, he was the one and they used all of us. And that to me was just kind of a fresh, different way of looking at it. And I know all of us are praying for Dorsey to never get on a ladder again. <laughs> and, you know, but we're praying for healing and, and things of that nature. But, you know, when people come to our minds, we need to s- safely stop <laughs> whatever it is we're doing and text or pray or whatever, write a card, whatever. And because the Lord is going through you to reach that person. And that person will be blessed. You'll be blessed. And that also, I, I think I'm coming to realize, 
My mouth is so dry, I'm sorry. I'm coming to realize that that also builds faith is when you go and you do these things and and that is obedience to to the lord is stopping what you're doing and praying texting calling carding whatever um and i'm not real good at it these days and so what kathy and jp have talked about has challenged me and hopefully i don't forget <laughs> um and i appreciate what steve has shared today and don't ever apologize, brother, for getting up here because you're a blessing every time or for reading one more scripture. The Lord is telling you to read it, so read it, you know, and because um, I get something out of it every time. But I just want to um, say thanks for anybody and everybody who's prayed for me, and I appreciate that. And for Jeff, he's working. Well, he's sleeping. He's just got to work tonight. But um, we love you guys. And... Um, we appreciate all of you, and I hope everyone has a good afternoon and a Merry Christmas. Praise God, I've had a few thoughts this morning, uh, and I'm not necessarily up here to close the service, but I'll, I'll ask if anybody has, else has anything to share once I'm done. But uh, the first thought I had was, and Grandma, I don't see her back there. But anyway, she, I had dinner with her recently, and she, she told me a little fun fact that uh, sheep have a natural immunity in their blood to snake venom. I don't know if you all know that, but I thought that was a pretty, pretty awesome parallel to the gospel. Um, and after doing a little bit of research to see if that was if that was true, you know, they use actual snake or the sheep's DNA and antivenom vaccines to, you know, for us to combat if we get bitten by a snake. And I thought that was, I thought that was pretty good reflection of the gospel. Our our blood, which is naturally immune or naturally vulnerable to sin, the poison that the viper brought into the world, has to be replaced by another type of blood. And that's why the blood sacrifice was made. And that's by faith that we that we have that, and that Christ came, he was the lamb for us, and he was the only blood, his blood was the only blood that was pure, and that was invincible, that was immune to that, and so his, that's why his blood had to be shared, and that was just a really, really cool little parallel that grandma taught me, and I was thankful for that. Uh, the other thing, um, and I don't know, if any, does anybody else have anything you want to share this morning before I get to the next point? Yeah, okay, come on, come on, Ben.
just wanted to read this. It came to me a couple of times as different ones were speaking here this morning. Uh, but it's in John chapter 4. It's a, it's a passage we're really familiar with. But um, like I said, it just came to my heart a couple of different times this morning. It's starting in verse uh, 9. It says, this is how God showed his love among us. You know, we, we have the saying that actions speak louder than words, right? And God tells us many times in his word that he loves us and what he thinks of us. But more than just telling us, we've got something we could look at where he showed us what he thought about us. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Because we started out dead in trespasses and sins, didn't we? In that sense, we didn't even have life because the life that every, every creature is born into this world with, that's a very temporary life. It's easily ended by natural or unnatural means, and it's, it's, it's very brief. It's very fleeting. But there is a life that's eternal. There's a life that God himself has, and that's what he wants to share with us. He wants us to live with him, that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. We know this time of year, this is what we celebrate, the, the coming of our Savior into the world. This was the event more than anything else in history where God showed us how much he loved us. He sent his one and only son into this world, not to be a king and a ruler in, in the natural sense, not to be a celebrity or even so much a teacher he was for a time, but it wasn't to build some long ministry. It was to come and be the sacrifice for our sins. That's why he came into this world, because it's true that the wages of sin is death. I mean, sin is, it's an invader. It's an infection in God's universe. And like any good doctor, the only thing you can do with infection is destroy it before it wrecks everything. That's, we, we all understand that principle of how that works. Well, sin is going to be eradicated because there is coming a creation that God wants us to be a part of, and it's not going to be there. That infection won't exist there, and it won't infect anything in that new creation. So that sin is going to be totally destroyed. And whatever's still a part of that, whatever still clings to that, it's going to be destroyed along with it. But there's a way out of that. We were born into that. But our Savior made a way. He came to make a way to deliver us. And, but, but he had to die on that cross because the wages of sin is death. That, that, that death had to be poured out on that sin. But just like they symbolically used the animal to represent themselves, saying, yeah, it should be me dying for this sin, but you've allowed me to substitute this animal in my place. It's my representative. But death had to fall on that animal. That was what our Savior did for us. He came to be our sacrifice, to be our atoning sacrifice. He took our place on the cross. It wasn't for himself. He had no sin to die for, but he took ours on himself. And doesn't that itself show God's love to us? Every one of us. He put the sins of the whole world on him. If God only loved some people, I suppose he theoretically could have only put some people's sin on Christ. Well, I want that one, that one, and that one. I'll put their sin on Christ. He did that for everybody. He willingly took that on himself, though he had none of his own. He was our atoning sacrifice. And to be, and God had made a way to be able to forgive sin and yet uphold his justice. Right? The, his, the, his word says this sin must be destroyed. It must die. Well, then how can we possibly ever live with him? Because he sent a substitute. And that judgment was fully poured out on him. But it was in our place. And now we can go free because of what he did. We can have that new life on the inside because of him. Praise God. He came to be our atoning sacrifice. And, and not that we loved him first, not that we were seeking him, but he came after us, sent his son as the atoning sacrifice. Dear friends, since see, this is where, where it goes back to what else was being said this morning. I think about what Don was saying there. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. God's a spirit. He's got no physical form in the sense we think of it. He's, any form he would take would be something arbitrary because he's not a material being. He's a spirit. There's nothing to see in that sense with these natural eyes. We, don't, we haven't seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. That's a part of that process of making his love complete. Part of it is when we come to know his love and we return that love back to him. And we, we see it for what it is and we surrender to his word. Yes, Lord, what you say is true. I want to be a part of what you're doing. And that's, that's the first part of it. But it doesn't stop there. It's not just his love isn't made complete just when we love him back. It then, because what is God's nature? It's to reach out to others. It's to reach out to those that he loves and, and be invested in them and be doing things on their behalf. That's what he did when he sent his son. It was on our behalf. 
Well, that's what he calls us to do. And that's how his love is truly made complete. It says he comes in and then we live for one another. And then we begin to experience what Steve was talking about, that love that calls us into that daily relationship with him, that constant walk. And then we'll find, just like what Don was saying, that he's going to begin to give us opportunities to share that with others. That's why he came. That's what his, that's what his coming was all about. It was to, to make a way for us to have life, to live, and to have God's life in us. But his life can't be contained. It doesn't just stay here for our own benefit. So, oh, good, so I've got a great future one day. That's part of it, praise God, but that ain't all of it. It starts there, and it can't be contained. It's going to flow out to others, and he wants that to flow. And I believe he's drawing us closer and closer to himself so that we are more and more free to serve him to be what he wants us to be. I praise God. That's what he came for. That's what I want to be here for. That's what he said, right? I must be about my, my father's business. That was his testimony. Even as a young child, that was his testimony. I'm not here to serve myself and do my own thing. I want to be about my father's business. And I just praise God for that, that he's given us a way to come into his very presence, draw from him what we need to do what needs to be done here, but not just for us so that we can share it with others. Praise God. That is, that is the message of the gospel. <laughs> praise God for our Savior. That, that walk gets longer and longer, maybe because I'm getting older, I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, I was saying when, when uh, uh, Kathy was up talking about Barry and Kenny last July or something like that, I was thinking like, oh, there was a couple of times in our teenage days in his red dodge, I think it was buried both of us. <laughs> so, <laughs> but the Lord has mercy and grace, I tell you. He, <laughs> he watches over even, even the, the foolish so anyway, uh, that, that's not what I had to say. But anyway, uh, I'm going to uh, jump right in here. Ben, ben said a couple of things that made me think of this. So I'm going to um, I'm gonna read this and uh, uh, sit down until I know everybody's thinking it's close to 12. So um, anyway, <clears throat> let me jump in here. Um, this is in 2 Corinthians 5. I'm going to start 14. For the love of Christ... Uh, constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all then were all dead and that he died for just Steve Johnson no he said that he died for all every single person he died for I don't care how good you are or how bad you are the whole gamut he died for everybody you know you may think you're good and you may say, you know, like the rich young ruler, I've kept all the commandments. I'm righteous. What's it say about man's righteousness? They're as filthy rags. So if you think you're good, you need to check up again. But, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, that any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Thank God for that. When you, when you come to the Lord, he wipes everything away. You, you're, you're a new person in Christ. Thank God for that. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given, given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto him. Thank God for that. I tell you, he doesn't impute... He doesn't impute our sin. It, he, they are thrown in the sea of forgetfulness. Thank God for that. And hath committed us into the world of reconciliation. Now, then we are, and this is what made me think when Ben was talking about. Now, then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though Christ did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Be you reconciled to God. And this is the key, this whole chapter right here. At least I think so. For he made him to be sin for us. And this is, this is the key right here. Who knew no sin. You know, if, 
if you're standing before the judge and you've committed a crime and, and he says, well, what should I do, do to you? And, and some old criminal stands up and says, I'll go to jail for him. You know, you kind of think, well, he deserves to go to jail. Yeah, I, I deserve to go free. But here's the spotless Lamb of God that knew no sin that's taken our place. That, that's pretty profound right there. Who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I tell you, he didn't just cleanse us from our sins. He gave us his righteousness. I, I, I was asking a lot of everybody there. There's that song we sing about, you know, a uh, uh, new robe and an old You know, he's given us a new robe. The old robe was tattered and torn. He gave us a new robe. It's spotless, never been worn. God has given us his righteousness. And I tell you, when you come to, when you come to the Lord, the devil's going to try to tell you, oh, you know, you know, you're not worthy of it. That's true. The devil doesn't always lie about things. He's quoted the word. He quoted the word to the Lord. He doesn't always lie. That's true. We're not worthy. But devil, you know what? I'm going to point to the cross. The blood that was shed. I am made in God's righteousness right now. And I'm going to claim that. And I'm going to rejoice in it. And I'm going to tell you, you are a liar and the father of it. Because there's things he does lie to us. But I thought about this when Ben was up. Uh, about... He had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Thank God for that. Thank God. I know we've kind of turned this into an Easter service. But, you know, it's like Phil said, you know, recently, you can't separate Christmas and Easter. You can't. They go hand in hand. Really, every day should be Christmas. Every day should be Easter. We should thank God that he sent his son every day for us. And we should thank the Lord that he rose from the dead every day. Every day we need to thank God that he's risen from the dead and that, he, that death is no longer. You know, we have victory over death. We have the victory in him. We are more than conquerors in him. I thank God this morning that he became sin for me who knew no sin, that I might be made the righteousness of God. Thank God for that.